Hey guys, welcome back to my channel. In 1973, a woman named Maribel Morgan published a self-help book titled The Total Woman. The book, rooted in Christian evangelicalism, was a sort of how-to guide for married women on how to be better wives and have successful marriages. Its overarching message was that to be a good wife, a woman should conduct herself in extreme deference and submission to her husband. It's only when a woman surrenders her life to her husband, reveres and worships him and is willing to serve him that she becomes really beautiful to him. Famously, Morgan taught that wives should always be sexually available to their husbands and that when their husbands arrive home from work, they should greet them at the door wearing different sexy outfits. Some suggestions included a showgirl outfit and a cowgirl outfit. Hey, Drew, what would you do if you left for the day and like came home and I greeted you at the door wearing a cowgirl outfit? Uh, I mean, let's just say I think that I would be more intrigued when you ceased wearing the cowgirl outfit. Cowgirl, <laughs> not exactly my thing. Not my thing at all but, either. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, it wouldn't be entirely unsuccessful. <laughs> or I would say, this town ain't big enough for the two. <laughs> The book was a huge success and sold over 10 million copies. Women across the U.S. at this time were even putting on boot camps on how to become the total woman. I mean, it really seemed like the total woman was all the rage. But the book and the concept itself also received a lot of criticism, and rightly so, for its regressive and patriarchal teachings. Now that American women particularly are finally coming into their own, getting more and more opportunities, here you come along and want them to be nothing more than uh, than 40-year-old uh, bubbleheads, cheerleaders. I do want them to be cheerleaders, yes sir. Cheerleaders for their husband. In the 50 years since its publishing, I think more and more people are recognizing how harmful its supposed advice is. Not just for wives, but for anyone in committed relationships. I think even many evangelicals and certainly most Christians would now view the book's teachings on marriage as antiquated. Unfortunately, though, in the good old age of social media, the teachings of people like Maribel Morgan are now being spread online through evangelical Christian lifestyle influencers. Recently, I stumbled upon a Christian lifestyle vlogger named Milena Kikiati, and I'm so sorry if I'm mispronouncing her last name. I tried to look up how to pronounce it correctly, but I couldn't find anything, so... Apologies. It appears as though she started out her YouTube career doing makeup and beauty content, but most of her recent videos have titles like how to actually submit to your husband, how to glorify God in every moment, and how to make your home a slice of heaven. One of her recent videos in particular stood out to me. It's titled How to Have Your Husband Drooling Over You, Seven Things That Will Change Your Marriage. Now, before you say anything, no, this video didn't intrigue me because I'm just like desperate to get Drew to drool over me like I'm a bowl of samosa chat. No, this video intrigued me because of its very trad wife-esque imagery and its promise that it will change your marriage. That's a big promise to make for a vlogger who, as far as I'm aware, has no education or credentials in marriage counseling or family therapy. Watching the video through, I was shocked by much of Milena's advice, and it feels eerily similar to the teachings of a certain 70s era anti-feminist. 50 years later, The Total Woman, a book that many considered backward and deeply misogynistic, in the 70s is still influencing the culture of evangelicalism today and is now being spread to large audiences through a new medium, YouTube. So in today's video, I'm going to provide my commentary on Milena's video, How to Have Your Husband Drooling Over You, and also demonstrate how her video echoes the teachings of Maribel Morgan by citing excerpts from her book, The Total Woman. Before we jump into the reaction, I do want to make a disclaimer that I'm not saying Milena directly pulled from The Total Woman in order to make her video. I mean, it's very possible she's never heard of Maribel Morgan and hasn't actually read her book. The purpose of drawing parallels between Milena Elena's video and older evangelical literature is to show just how embedded this type of regressive thinking is in the modern evangelical landscape. All right, let's get this started. Also, I'm guessing this is going to be a very long video because so much of Milena's advice is just awful. So if I were you, I would grab yourself a little snack, pour yourself some wine because uh, 
we're going to be here a minute. Okay. So today we are going to be talking about how to have your husband drooling over you and falling more and more in love with you every single day. Honestly, I would really like to know if Melina read The Total Woman in preparation for her video because even some of the wording is super similar. Um, just as an example, in the introduction of her book, Maribel claims that by following her advice, any wife can get her husband to absolutely adore her in a few weeks' time. So it really seems like the premise of Melena's video and the premise of the book are pretty similar, i.e. here are some tips to get your husband obsessed with you again. This is so contrary to how the world is and how the world talks, you know? They are so about the longer you're married, well, the longer you're married, the boring year it gets, or like the more you fall out of love, or like you change and da 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 da. And that is just not what the Bible says. Every year that goes by that you are married to your spouse, you guys should be more intentional, you should be more intimate, you should be more gentle, more kind. All of these traits, every year of your marriage should only deepen and get stronger and unite you and your husband with the Lord. And so it's so countercultural because I looked up the statistic and it said that in the world divorce happens in year five to eight and so it shows based off of research that most people get divorced after being married for a longer period of time and of course that makes sense like of course there's more baggage there's more stuff that happens there's more time for resentment but that is just not biblical and so i really want to just shake things up and just point you back to what god's word says so we can really study it she's using some christian insider lingo here um by the world she means secular or non-Christian environments. And in this environment, she says, the longer you're married, the more disinterested you become to the point of no longer being in love with your spouse. Her language is a bit vague, so I'm not exactly sure if she's saying that the world preaches that this is normal and acceptable, but that's the vibe I'm getting from what she's saying. She then says that this idea is backed up by statistics, that in the world, divorce tends to happen between years five to eight. Now, it's true that divorce peaks between these years. From the research I did, it looks like divorce peaks between years three to seven, but that doesn't actually back up the idea that the longer worldly people are married, the more likely they are to divorce. Statistics show that the rate of divorce drops drastically to only about 4% of couples for those who are married longer than a decade. So in actuality, the longer people are married, the less likely they are to divorce. I, I think it's possible that Melina already had this idea that worldly people don't value marriage like Christians do, and then interpreted limited or irrelevant data to support this, which is just a perfect example of confirmation bias. She also says that if you're living your life according to biblical principles, the longer you're married, the more in love you'll be with your spouse and the less likely you are to divorce. Here's the thing though, uh, data doesn't necessarily support this idea. According to a study published by a professor at the University of Texas at Austin, the strongest factors predicting divorce rates in the U.S. after controlling for things like higher rates of poverty is the concentration of conservative or evangelical Protestants. Religiously conservative states like Alabama or Arkansas have some of the highest rates of divorce at 13 per 1,000 people per year while states like New Jersey and Massachusetts, states that are typically less religiously conservative, have some of the lowest rates at six to seven per 1,000 people per year. So divorce rates are actually higher among some groups that profess to be living their life according to biblical principles. This could be explained by a culture that encourages marrying young and discourages things like sex outside of marriage and cohabitation. Please note that this study concluded that divorce rates are higher in areas that have concentrations of conservative or evangelical Protestants, not Protestants in general. So please don't get the idea from this that like 
simply being a Christian means you're more likely to divorce. However, from her videos, I have gathered that Milena is in fact a conservative evangelical. I have seven things, seven practical things for you to try doing this week. Now, I know seven's a lot, so you might not want to do all of them this week because that might be overwhelming, but see which one really resonates with you and stick to it, cling with it, and try it for seven days. I like specifically did seven with seven and seven because that is the beautiful number that God loves and the number of completion. So pray on it, see which one just really hit home or which one it has been hard for you, which one the enemy has trying to take victory over and no more today, Satan. That ends now. Again, it's just like really weird how many parallels there are between Melina's video and The Total Woman. Because at the end of each chapter, uh, Maribel has these like action items that the reader is supposed to implement that week. I, I just, the formatting of the book and Melina's video is pretty similar, but I mean, it could just be coincidence. I want us to first flip over to 1 Corinthians 7 because in Corinthians, Paul is talking to the church of Corinth here is telling them what the unity and the principles of marriage should be. So now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is not good for a man to not have sexual relations with a woman, but because of the temptation of sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman have her own husband. The husband should give his life to her rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another, except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves in prayer, but then come back together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now it does go on a little bit more and you should definitely read, but I feel like this was the meat and potatoes that I really wanted to get at. And that is that as a wife, your body does not belong to you. And as a husband, his body doesn't belong to him, but to you. This should bleed into every aspect of your life. And this should be reflected, especially in your marriage. And this idea of wives like getting angry at their husbands and using sex as manipulation or just being nagging or like the list can go on and on. And that is just not biblical. The Bible talks quite at length about all these things. So I just wanted to highlight them. And I really hope Samson's not being too distracting. I don't know why he's so excited about his dog bone. Um, she might want to reread that verse because it kind of seems like she she missed something there. So yeah, Milena actually misquoted that verse. Um, it actually says it is good for a man to not have sexual relations with a woman. According to many scholars, Paul had this belief that having sexual urges or just like being horny was undesirable because it distracts you from thinking on godly things. He taught that in the case that you just can't control your sexual urges, then you should go ahead and marry so that you can release that tension rid that as a distraction, and then refocus your thoughts back to God. A common modern interpretation of these verses is that you shouldn't deprive your spouse of sex because it could lead to one of you being tempted sexually, resulting in extramarital affairs or other sexual immoralities. I think this is most likely the interpretation that Milena would have of these verses. It is interesting to me that she brings up these verses in the opening of her video because Many, many times in her book, Maribel talks about how the wife should be sexually available to her husband. And here's the kicker, the risk of not being sexually available is that he could wind up cheating on you. Yeah, she like straight up teaches that your responsibility as a wife is to prevent your husband from wronging you. Don't use sex as a weapon or a reward. Or as the Bible says, do not cheat each other of normal sexual intercourse. God understood women. He knew they would probably use the prized possession of sex to manipulate men, and he warned against rationing it out. The Bible also states, let her breast satisfy thee at all times and be thou ravished with her love. A wife is to love her husband constantly and unconditionally. Withholding sex in marriage as a form of punishment can only destroy the relationship. The woman who does her best to meet her mate's sexual needs goes a long way toward making him immune to the allure of other women. The wife who refuses to give her husband reasonable sexual satisfaction is literally asking him to go elsewhere. I think your body belonging to someone else and you equally having ownership over someone else's body is a very harmful concept. 
It robs you of your autonomy and creates this environment for abuse to thrive because a husband or a wife has this idea that they have ownership over their partner's body. Sex isn't something that anyone is owed, but it's something that individuals in any type of relationship dynamic should openly communicate about and equally agree upon. I have seen some Christians interpret these verses differently when it says that a husband and a wife have authority over each other's bodies. They say that what this means is that they have the right to ask each other for sexual pleasure. Basically, they have the right to communicate with their partner about their expectations surrounding sex. But I don't really know how widespread this interpretation is. Another thing that the Bible talks at length in, in 1 Peter 3, I'm sorry, I really hope he's not being too loud. He's just really excited. 1 Peter 3, it talks about husbands and wives, and it talks about wives being subject to their own husbands, so that if some of them do not obey the word, they be, may be won over without a word, but by the conducts of their wife. And when they see your respectful and pure conduct, do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of the hair, the putting on the gold jewelry, or the clothing you wear, but let your adorning be in a hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit which in God's sight is very precious for this is how a holy woman who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Adam calling him Lord and that you are her child if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs of you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. So this is, that's a lot. What does that even look like? What can that look like practically? Because I think sometimes we read these things and we're like, y'all bro, um, Sarah's over here calling Abraham Lord. Like, what is it with these people? Like, it can seem a little bit strange for us in our reality. I'm going to wait to add much commentary to this because later on in her video, we'll see exactly how Milena interprets these verses and how she applies this concept of husbands being won over by the conduct of their wives. She is hitting on something interesting here when she says that it's kind of strange for us to read these verses in 2023. She's absolutely right because the way early Christians conceptualized things like marriage and sexuality was completely different than how modern Christians conceptualize those things now. That's why I think there is a danger in looking only to the Bible to solve modern problems. It's often like trying to fit a square peg in a round hole. You can wind up harming yourself or your relationships when you try to adapt certain biblical passages to modern life. But unfortunately, a lot of people still think that this works. Recently, U.S. Congressman Mike Johnson, an evangelical Christian conservative, was elected as the new House Speaker. In a recent Fox News interview, Johnson said the following, Someone asked me today in the media, people are curious, what does Mike Johnson think about any issue? I said, well, go pick up a Bible off of your shelf and read it. That's my worldview. I came across this story on Ground News, a platform I use to find high quality sources and access reliable information and the sponsor of today's video. All the articles on any given story are conveniently located all in one place with context other media sources don't provide. Let's take a closer look at how the media responded to this story. Less than 10 articles were published on it, and the first thing I noticed was more than half of these articles are from sources rated right-leaning and mixed factuality, which tells me headlines are likely subjective and sensationalized. When I looked even closer, I noticed that left-leaning sources display Mike Johnson's religious commitment as active opposition, specifically against LGBTQ rights, while right-leaning sources present him as a defender of Christianity. It's interesting to read the news this way and see how easily the media can take a specific angle with a story to shape public opinion. Ground News has been sponsoring Drew's channel and I actually use their website as a resource tool while writing this very video, so I'm excited to have them as today's sponsor. I recommend you check it out at ground.news slash antibot. You can subscribe for under $1 a month, or take advantage of their biggest sale of the year, 40% off unlimited access to the Vantage plan, which is what I have, by using my link. With everything that's going on in the world right now, I think it's a great time to have access to tools like this that help you stay informed and look at all sides of a story. Now back to the video. I wanted to share to have us just try this week. Again, be prayerful about these things, pray for a softened heart, and pray that the Holy Spirit just prompt you to which one of these. It can be all of them, or it can just be one at a time. But I am telling you, 
right now, if you start implementing these, your marriage will change. Like that is a fact because God's word is true. And at first Peter tells us that a husband will not be won over by a single word by but the conduct of his wife. And so with these things, your marriage will change. Things will change. It will get better, but it's not going to happen by feeding your flesh. It's not going to happen by continuing to not die to your flesh. If you keep feeding your flesh, if you keep doing what you want, it is going to take a heart change. So I just pray for the Lord to change your heart, to have a renewing of your mind, renewing of your spirit, like just completely give you a renewed everything because without the Holy Spirit and without Christ, it's really hard to do those things. Again, she's kind of misquoting the verse. It doesn't say a husband won't be won over by a single word, but by the conduct of his wife. It says, so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be won over without a word by the conduct of their wives. The verse is talking about husbands turning their lives over to Christ through observing the purity and faithfulness of their wives. This might seem like a small distinction, but I think it is important because well, we'll get to that shortly. The first one that I want you to try this week is to pray instead of nag. Now, the Bible actually talks quite a lot about nagging. If you want to flip over to Proverbs with me, I'm going to read Proverbs 25, 25, 24. It is better to live in a corner of a housetop and a house shared with the quarrelsome wife. It's literally saying that it's better to live in an attic than it is to live with the quarrelsome wife. Ask yourself, very bluntly ask yourself this question right now. Am I a quarrelsome wife? Am I the type of wife that always has to have the last say? Am I the type of wife that always has to question, that always has to nag, that always has to have the last word and like confrontational after confrontation? Am I the type of wife that is just quarreling? Am I the one that's always big and asking and initiating issues or dilemmas like ask genuinely ask yourself and if you are having a hard time getting an answer ask your husband because I guarantee you he'll let you know the truth another verse to flip open to is Proverbs 14 1 this one will kind of just hit you right in right where it hurts Proverbs 14 1 I feel like she was about to say right in the balls and then didn't <laughs> <laughs> the wisest of women build her home, but with fully her own hands tear it down. We have to ask ourselves these questions. Am I, with my own hands and with my own two hands right now, am I building up my house? Am I speaking life over my kids? Am I speaking life over my husband? Am I doing what I can to die to my flesh every single day to serve my husband? Or am I tearing my house down with my nagging, with my words, with my hatred, with my blah, 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 you fill in the blank. Because you have the ability to build your house up or you have the same ability with the same pair of hands to completely tear it down. So she's lumping together a lot of different behaviors under this one umbrella that she is called nagging, always having to question. I mean, having to question that that's not a bad thing to begin with, but always having to question and being confrontational, being hateful. Those aren't the same thing as nagging, but I'll give her the benefit of the doubt here and assume that she's just trying to communicate that instead of engaging in generally hostile behaviors, wives should pray. I do want to address her use of the term nagging, though. The nagging wife is a very outdated and harmful stereotype about married women. Women are often labeled as nags when making repeated but reasonable requests of their, well, apathetic husbands. For example, a wife who has to ask her husband five times to take out the trash while he wastes the night away playing video games is sometimes accused of nagging. I actually found a pretty good article published on Psychology Today that talks about this topic. By using the derogatory term nag, a man trivializes the woman's request and at the same time puts her in her place. In other words, it's a double-edged power play. It saves him actually having to do anything in response to her request until he's good and ready, if at all. By resisting her efforts to mold him to her will, the man can look as if he's in control when he agrees to the request. As you've probably guessed, the topic of nagging is brought up many times in the book, The Total Woman, but I'm gonna wait to talk about that until we finish this section. I'm telling you, when we ask ourselves these questions, when we bring it to the Lord and ask for his help, when we ask for wisdom, he will help us in these areas. So what I want you to try and do this week, when you want to nag, tame your tongue, tame the tongue. The Bible has quite a lot to say about that. Let's go to James real quick. I'm not gonna read all of it. James three, if you want to, read and meditate on anything this week if you have a hard time taming your tongue. Read James 3 specifically, 1 
1 through 12. It just talks about just taming your tongue really, really good. It says how small a tongue is. It can do great things and that we can't tame our tongue. It's deadly, full of poison, etc. So if taming the tongue is something that you struggle with, definitely read this. And there's a bunch in Proverbs too. But next time you want to nag, tame your tongue and pray. So let's say it's an issue of your husband every single night has been coming home. He's not helping. There's something that is irritating and he just goes and plays video games with hours. Instead of nagging in front of him, instead of asking him to turn it off, pray about it. Ask the Holy Spirit to convict him about this. Jackie Hill Perry actually shared about how recent, I don't know how recent, but she shared about it recently where her husband was playing with these video games that she didn't really like, like they were gory or whatever. And she didn't nag about it. She prayed about it. And she said that a couple weeks later, her husband came to her and was like, yeah, you know, babe, I'm not going to be playing with those video games anymore. And she's like, okay, for sure. You know, and she didn't have to say a single thing. The Holy Spirit prompted that. So pray. I have a friend who her husband was listening to very secular rap music that just like was not a good a, a good influence sorry bob too loud melanie and i were like you just need to pray and we even asked her to write it down in her prayer journal and she did and not even a week passed by before her husband came to her and was like you know i'm not gonna be really listening to that music anymore i'm gonna be looking for some christian rap pray spend just as much time as you would nagging praying because the prayer closet is very powerful and your husband will not be won over by a single word that you say not a single word that you say will win him over but by the conduct so if he sees you in the prayer closet if he sees you living out your life the way that you do instead of nagging him into that that is how he's going to be won over so next time you want to nag tame the tongue pray instead oh my god <laughs> Girl, we got to sit down and have a chat because asking your husband to help you around the house, a house that he lives in and has equal responsibility for, isn't nagging and is certainly not hateful or quarrelsome, especially if he's in this pattern of coming home and playing video games instead of actually taking care of his responsibilities. Okay, let's break down how we got to this point. Milena misquotes 1 Peter 3 to say that husbands won't be won over by a single word their wife says. Again, if you read the verse, that's not exactly what it says. Instead, Milena thinks that if you want to communicate your needs to your husbands, wives just need to pray and like send out good vibes. This also led her to associate making reasonable requests of her husband with confrontational behavior. So in The Total Woman, Morgan tells this story of how her husband got upset with her for what he determined was nagging because she had asked him multiple times to take the trash out. He then decided to deliberately not take out the trash because she was quote unquote, nagging him and treating him like a child. Then I decided to stop nagging altogether. I would bite my tongue instead. I would say it once and then the decision is his. I finally realized that my man's home is his castle or at least it should be. He should feel free in the privacy of his own castle, free to do what he wants, even if that means draping his clothes over the furniture, drawing pictures on the walls or eating pizza for 47 days straight. Nagging him over trivia will only drive him up the wall or out the door. Maribel decided that her husband's bad behavior was somehow her responsibility. She reasoned that the problem wasn't that her husband failed to participate in household chores, but that she had repeatedly tried to communicate this fact to her husband. This is a common theme throughout the book, that the wife is responsible for her husband's behavior. If he's upset or not doing something he should be doing, then it must be because you as a wife don't have the right attitude or you're not fulfilling your godly role. Milena seems to be doing the same thing here. Instead of placing responsibility on her husband for not taking care of the things he should be taking care of, she puts the responsibility on herself and believes the problem comes down to how she, as the wife, is responding to his behavior. Something that neither Milena or Maribel consider is, if you're having to treat your husband like a child, then maybe he's acting like a child. Maybe he's the problem. I think the worst part of Milena's advice is that it discourages couples from having open and honest communication. In all of the examples Milena gave, she advocates for silence and prayer 
rather than talking to your partner about what's bothering you. Now, I, I don't have credentials in marriage counseling, but I don't really think I need any to say that open and honest communication is foundational to a healthy relationship. Discouraging that is probably one of the most counterproductive things you could possibly do. There's small groups of extremist fundamentalists who believe that it's wrong to seek out medical help when you're sick or injured. Instead, they believe a true Christian should just pray and wait for God's intervention. I think what Milena is advocating for here isn't that far off from this, albeit with, you know, less devastating consequences. She is telling her followers that instead of taking action, you should just pray and wait for divine intervention. If you're a Christian or otherwise religious, I don't think there's any harm in praying for your partner or partners. But if you're solely relying on prayer to fix your relationship, then I think you're setting yourself up for failure. Hey, Drew. So what's been a running joke since I started researching this video? <laughs> Let's act it out in the context okay. of you asking me or saying something to me about the dishes earlier. Okay. So what did you say about the dishes and how I loaded the dishwasher? So I, I told you that it, it's best to just start the dishwasher even if it's not completely full because it helps to keep the dishes from piling up in the sink. Yeah. And so I said, oh, okay, I didn't realize that. I'll do that next time. And then we both said, well, you should have prayed about it. Instead have prayed. Of <laughs> I should have prayed instead of asking you directly. Yeah. Ugh, I'm, I'm not a godly woman. You're a nagging wife. <laughs> Number two, be extremely kind and extremely generous this week. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It keeps no record of wrong. When we look at what loves mean in 1 Corinthians 13, it tells us all of this list. I specifically chose to be extremely kind and generous because I feel like as the longer you get married, you become annoyed with the little things. The things that you used to once love about your husband so much seem to be the things that tick you off so much. And so I specifically chose kind because we tend to be the nastiest to the people that we claim to love the most. We claim to love this person to death, to blah, 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 blah at our vows. And then comes the day in and day out and we are just like the absolute meanest to them. I do think Melina does have a point here. The longer you're in a relationship, the more likely you are to be unfiltered and less careful with how you speak to your partner or partners. I think this could be because in more established long-term relationships, there's less of a fear of your partner leaving. You're not trying to win them over, so to speak. So I do think her advice here is good. We should be careful not to speak to our partners in a flippant manner. I really want to encourage you to be extremely kind and extremely generous. Go out of your way to serve your husband in ways that you normally don't. So let's say your husband wakes up really early in the morning. He's out the door by five. Wake up with him. Make his coffee with him. Do some of his chores. Like Jordan is strictly in charge of the dogs. And the days that I will pick up his chore before he comes home, it completely will change his afternoon. It's so simple and so small, but can make such a big difference. Stop complaining. That's a really nice way to be kind. I feel like sometimes we can get into this nagging complaining mode that every word out of our mouth is just like a spiral of complaints. Try to just tame your tongue this week and just really not complain. For every complaint that you want to do, back it up with three things that you're thankful for and be vocal about them. If you have been wanting to get new clothes or something, but it's just not in the budget right now, instead of complaining to your husband about that, why don't you say, I'm so thankful that I have winter clothes this year. I'm so thankful that I have a closet that it has things that I'm able to wear today. Like replace the complaint with something that you're thankful for and go out of your way to serve. Write him a note, drop him off a note at work on his car. Like pack up the kids, head over there. Or if you work on your way to work, drop him something off in his car or meet up for lunch. Like try help him do something different that is super generous and kind to your own spouse. These are all kind of vague because you know your spouse best or I pray that you do. So where do you feel like would just really hit home for him? Where do you feel like he would be like, wow, thanks. Or ask yourself, what would it mean for you if he did this thing? And then speak life over him. Be super kind with your words. Be generous with your time and just be sweet. Speak life's words or just express gratitude or say he looks handsome. That. Did she say speak lice words? 
I don't know what that is. Or that he smells nice or that you like the way his hair looks or you like that shirt on him. Just be kind and generous. I want to preface my response here by saying that these suggestions aren't necessarily bad. The problem I have is that she's making these rather definitive and surface level statements about how to improve your marriage. Statements like, stop complaining. On the surface, this doesn't seem like a bad suggestion, but it does leave out a lot of nuance. Sometimes there are situations that weren't complaining. Sometimes in order to emotionally process, you do just need to vent to your husband about wishing there was more money in the budget for new clothes. This is the problem I have with some conservative Christian YouTubers who for whatever reason, platform themselves as these pseudo counselors or life guides. They believe that there's one straightforward answer to everything and that the Bible addresses all of life's questions. I think that this results in them having a very one dimensional view of relationships and offering very oversimplified advice. Relationships are dynamic and there's not one solution to every problem. If you want to improve your marriage, I suggest seeking out information from credentialed and educated individuals, which is not Milena and is not me. I also think it's interesting that when it comes to being kind and generous to your husband, Milena places this huge emphasis on serving. Almost every suggestion she gave had to do with doing something for your husband, which don't get me wrong, I think it's great to do something nice for your spouse, but I wonder if the large emphasis on serving comes from the fact that in some conservative Christian circles, wives are valued for what they can do for their husbands, things like cooking, cleaning, sex, and they're not really valued for who they are as people. Consider this excerpt from The Total Woman. It is only when a woman surrenders her life to her husband, reveres and worships him, and is willing to serve him, does she become really beautiful to him. She becomes a priceless jewel, the glory of femininity, his queen. As a final note on this section, I do find Milena's continued use of Christian insider lingo a bit annoying. Like what does speaking life over him actually mean? As opposed to what, speaking death? I think phrases like these are often just buzzwords that carry very little meaning. It's gonna be a spicy one, but I'm telling you, this is one that I can attest that has really drastically changed our marriage, and that is to be sexually generous. Be sexually generous to your husband this week. Do I need to say more? I'll say, I'll say just a little bit. Us women, for the most part, connect more by talking. We like to express our feelings. That's how we feel connected. Men, a majority of the time, feel connected by touching. There is a lot of data that proves how men and women are wired differently and our husbands do feel more connected to us when they're intimate with us. And I think a lot of wives want this connection with their husbands through words and affirmations and ways that is really difficult for a man to speak when in reality all he wants to do is physically love on us and touch us. Okay so again Milena is drawing from outdated stereotypes about gender. I, I find it interesting that she says that there's so much data to support that men and women are wired differently but then she never actually brings up the data in question. Like if there's so much data what is the data? The idea that men and women view relationships in entirely different ways actually comes from pop psychology, from books like Men Are From Mars, Women Are From Venus. This book from the 90s was criticized for playing into stereotypes and more recent research, which I'll, I'll link down below, demonstrates that it's untrue that men and women think about their relationships in qualitatively different ways and that any differences are a matter of degree rather than a matter of category. Although she did qualify her statements with for the most part and a majority of the time, that doesn't take away from the fact that these statements are simply not true. It's not true that a majority of the time men just inherently desire physical intimacy over emotional intimacy, and it's also not true that women, for the most part, inherently want to connect through words and care less about physical intimacy. Of course, Maribel upholds these same stereotypes, and many of the ideas put forward in her book are built on the assumption that men and women are different. Remember how Milena mentioned that women want to express their feelings more than men do? We women are so different than that strange but wonderful male species. Often we start from totally different premises when we try to communicate. A man talks to his wife so he can express ideas and information. A woman wants to talk about feelings and emotions. 
We as humans have this tendency to place people into boxes because it helps simplify our thought processes. The problem is, though, things like biological sex, gender, and sexuality are on a spectrum. And as I mentioned before, differences are a matter of degree, not category. Not to mention that societal and cultural norms can influence and shape behavior. It's potentially harmful to share advice on how women can improve their marriages that's based on these broad categories and assumptions, especially when coupled with these very definitive statements like, be sexually generous. Every relationship dynamic is unique, and determining what works best and what makes everyone in a relationship feel loved and connected and supported should be mutually agreed upon by those in the relationship. Don't forget what 1 Corinthians says in 7, that your body belongs to your husband and your husband's body belongs to you. And so to withhold sex from your spouse is sinful. That is a sin. Now, of course, if there is medical stuff, if you are not physically able, if you're postpartum, this isn't applied to you. But if you're a wife who is physically fine and capable and able, but is just withholding because you're bitter about something, that is not okay. This idea that withholding sex from your husband is sinful has been used by many, many, many men to demand sex from their wives and justify marital essay. There's a lot of reasons besides for just medical or illness related reasons that someone might not want to have sex with their partner, including they might just not be in the mood. And that's okay. Like I mentioned before, I reject the idea that your body belongs to someone else. I don't think anyone is owed sex, even inside a marriage. Sex is something that should be decided on by those in the relationship, and a healthy relationship isn't always determined by the frequency of sex. So this week, I really want to encourage you to just be sexually generous. Put lingerie on. Like when he comes home from work, have just lingerie on. No wonder. Why not have a martini too? I mean, why stop at the lingerie? If we're going 50s era housewife, let's, let's commit to the bit. <laughs> wear under your apron or like be creative. I feel like it's so easy. The enemy wants so badly to get you two into bed together before marriage and so badly to get you two out of the bed after marriage. It is interesting to me that she specifically suggests having lingerie on when your husband comes home because like the thing that the total woman is best remembered for is Maribel's instruction for women to welcome their husbands home from work by wearing sexy outfits. It actually became like this entire cultural phenomenon and the idea was even joked about in the dialogue of several TV shows over the last few decades. Now, if you wanna wear lingerie when your partner comes home, more power to you. But this suggestion is connected to this larger narrative that wives should be sexually available to their husbands as much as possible because supposedly that's how men feel connected. I also think that Milena's probably getting this advice from an older generation, say maybe from a housewife that wrote a book in the 70s, because it's based on the assumption that the husband works outside of the home. In 2023, it's pretty common for people to work from home, especially since the pandemic. So if your husband works from home, like this advice doesn't really make any sense. Having sex when you are married is spiritual warfare, you guys. It is the most unifying and beautiful thing that a couple can do. And I know this topic makes a lot of Christians cringe and just like there's a lot about this. I've shared and talked about it on Instagram a little bit about it here and there. I do plan on making an entire video on this topic of sex. I just don't feel like the Lord's calling me into that yet. So I am waiting, but I did want to say this and not only be sexually generous, but like initiate sex, like initiate, let him know know that you desire him. It's your husband. You are the only person that he can have sex with and he's the only person you can have sex with. Why would you abstain and not do that with each other? Like it, it doesn't make sense. It's so beautiful what God created. Conservative Christian YouTubers have this tendency to place sex on a pedestal and claim that it's the most powerful thing you can do as a married couple. They completely sidestep or are ignorant of the fact that some people are asexual or are on the asexual spectrum. So for some relationships, sex isn't that important of a factor or isn't a factor at all, and they aren't any less valid. I do worry about her viewers watching this video and then feeling guilty that they don't have a strong sexual desire 
but then forcing themselves to engage in sexual activity because they're told that's what's normal and godly. If you're coming from Alana's channel, I just want to say that don't let anyone pressure you into meeting their arbitrary standards. If you and your partner are happy with the amount of sex you're having, that's all that matters. If you are a Christian and you have a hard time seeing this as anything more than not beautiful, I have a book to recommend to you guys. It's called Holy Sex and it's by Michael Pearl. I like debated recommending this book because I know the pearls have people are very opinionated about them and there's a lot of controversy around them. Oh no. So um, saying that there's a lot of controversy around the pearls is an understatement. It's like saying that there's a lot of controversy around Jim Jones. Yeah, like he led a mass suicide of his entire religious cult, but it's like just controversy. The Pearls are fundamentalist Christian authors best known for their book To Train Up a Child that advocates for child abuse. They teach that a parent must break their child's will by doing things like spanking them with a plastic tube, withholding food from them, and placing them under a cold water hose. Three children actually died as a result of their parents following the Pearl's advice in this book. Yeah, it's some pretty fucked up shit. Any marriage advice the Pearls offer is gonna be entirely informed by Christian fundamentalism. Fundy Fridays actually has some good videos on the Pearls that I'll link down below, but per Jen's research, the Pearls have a zero tolerance stance when it comes to divorce, even in the case of abuse and they believe that women were designed to be help meets for men. So yeah, it's pretty scary to me that Milena is suggesting that her viewers read anything from the pearls. So in The Total Woman, <laughs> Maribel dedicates an entire quarter of the book to discussing sex. And surprise, surprise, Maribel also believes that men connect to their wives largely through sex and physical intimacy, and that it's the wife's job to always meet her husband's sexual needs. Remember that the tone for the evening is set during the first four minutes after your husband comes home tonight. His senses will be anticipating food and sex. If he wants to make love tonight, love him extravagantly and wastefully. Your husband wants you to want him sexually. He wants you to enjoy lovemaking as much as he does. If you fail in this area, he is devastated. Down inside, he feels he is an utter failure. Believe in him and tell him so. Let him know he's your special project in life. Prepare now for making love tonight. This is part of our class assignment. In fact, by the second week, the women are to be prepared for sexual intercourse every night for a week. Get some cute lingerie. If you don't have any, go get some. Or what is your husband like? You should know. You're the one sleeping with him. So ask yourself, what have I noticed my husband really likes? And enjoy your husband this week. Number four. Meet him at the door. Now this one is so easy to do. It's such a good and fun habit to get into and clean up the house before he comes home. Get the kids all tidied up. Put some nice calming music on. Have dinner started. Like make home an inviting and welcoming peaceful space. I've been talking a lot about this on my channel and series that I've done talking about having a peaceful home and having your house feel like a sliver of heaven. So I'll link those videos down below because because I definitely bring more of that in detail there. But this one specifically, like your physical home, like meet him at the door. Do you know how exciting that is? Like our rule in the house is that I get to kiss the first. Cause sometimes the kids just like get so excited and want to see him so bad. But I always tell them like, no, I get to kiss the first. Y'all get to wait. I get his first kiss. And get excited when he greet him at the door. Say hi, have the house picked up. Like put yourself in his shoes. I feel like after a long day of work, the last thing you want to come home to is like a dirty home and just getting kids thrown at you. And I've done that. I've shared with you guys that that was me when Jordan was traveling and in the secret service and I had two under a year and a half and I was very pregnant and very tired and working all the time. Like I remember home was just not quote unquote pleasant and I would take that out on him. And that's just not being a godly wife. That is not honoring. And that's definitely not having my husband drooling over me. If anything, he's looking at me like, you all right? So she probably shouldn't have taken it out on her husband when she was stressed out while he was traveling. But 
I, I think it makes sense why she was in that negative headspace. It seems like she was in a tough situation with a lot of responsibility. Now, I'm I'm not completely sure if she's saying that she was an ungodly wife for being stressed or if she's saying she was an ungodly wife for lashing out at him. I think I'm gonna give her the benefit of the doubt here and assume that she meant that about the latter. Still though, it seems like she's placing the blame and responsibility on herself in both situations. She was responsible for her stress when her husband was traveling, and she's also responsible for her husband's stress in their current situation. No matter how you slice it, the work and emotional labor is somehow always placed on the wife. Pick up your makeup. Don't take off your makeup before he comes home. Get it all, get yourself all dolled up and ready for your husband. Put a cute little apron on. Oh dear Lord. <laughs> you know, she's gotta be getting this advice from like some old people when she says shit like, get yourself dolled up. Pick up the house for five minutes. Like I'm not, I'm not telling you to deep clean the whole house. Just like put a couple toys away, throw them in the basket. Like just add a quick little tidy up around the house. Wipe off the snot off the kids' faces, you know? Okay, there's, a lot to unpack here, so let's kind of simplify what she's saying. She's saying, if you want your husband drooling over you, you need to have your house, your kids, and yourself organized, cleaned, and looking a certain way. His affection is somehow predicated on those things. In my very humble opinion, this advice places unrealistic expectations on stay-at-home moms. Taking care of the children and the home is a full-time job. In fact, it's, it's more than a full-time job. While yes, your husband probably had a long day at work, so have you. So why is it then the wife's responsibility to create this like serene environment for her husband to relax in. Does he not have responsibility for this as well? Also, what about women who don't wear makeup? I wear makeup pretty much only when I film videos or go out, which is not that often. <laughs> Am I somehow less appealing to my partner because I'm not wearing makeup? Like so much of this is completely based on outdated gender norms and outdated expectations for how women are supposed to show up in family life and in society. She really sounds like she wants her viewers to embody the, the 50s era housewife. Also, didn't she quote 1 Peter 3 at the beginning of this video where it says, don't let your adorning be external. So are we just going to misquote verses and then ignore other verses when they don't line up with what our little helpful tips are here? <laughs> now, please humor me and check out these excerpts from The Total Woman and Tell me whether or not you think this sounds eerily similar to the advice Milena gave. Determined to be a charming atmosphere adjuster tonight. Greet him at the door with your hair shining, your beautifully made up face radiant, your outfit sharp and snappy, even though you're not going anywhere. This is all your husband asks from you. He wants the girl of his dreams to be feminine, soft and touchable when he comes home. That's his need. If you are dumpy, stringy, or exhausted, he's sorry he came. That first look tells him your nerves are shot, his dinner is probably shot, and you'd both like to shoot the kids. It's a bad scene. If your husband comes home in the next 10 minutes, what would he see? Look around right now. Are the cabinet drawers open? Are there toys strewn from one end of the house to the other? Are there dirty dishes still in the sink and a vacuum cleaner in the living room? Don't despair. Here's how you can have it looking fit for a king and keep it that way. And if you work too, you both greet each other. Like it doesn't matter where you're coming from or if he's not coming home to you or when you do come home, like make an effort to make this fit into your schedule, into your routine, into your guys' life. Obviously all of these like aren't gonna apply to everyone because not everyone lives in the same situations, but apply this to your home and to your situation. I am glad that she finally did admit that not all of these tips are applicable to everyone, but then she followed that up by saying, apply this to your situation. So I'm not really sure what to take from that. Also, I mean, she did say this in the beginning of her video. But I am telling you right now, if you start implementing these, your marriage will change. Like that is a fact. And again, I, I, I don't mean to be a dead horse, but the problem I have with these conservative Christian YouTubers is that so many of them want to play counselor to their audiences, but a lot of their advice is just overgeneralized, informed by fundamentalist ideas, and full of misinformation. 
I mean, they can do some real damage with the ideas they spread. Number five, praise him for the little things. The little things amount to big things. And so if this is an area that has been hard for you to find thankfulness in and hard for you to appreciate in, it starts with the small things. An unthankful heart will always be discontent. And if you're always discontent, you're always gonna be unjoyful and displeased. But when you are joyful and when you are thankful, that is how you have a holy joy. That has is how you are your joy is unshaken because you're consistently thankful and so thank him for the little things maybe you asked him 20 times to put the trash out or do something and he finally did it instead of being like thanks it took me 45 times for you to do it say thank you honey i really appreciate that well yeah do you probably don't need to say it in that tone but if it's a constant issue that you have to ask your husband 20 times before he'll actually do something, then you guys probably do need to sit down and have a conversation about why he's not hearing you and not taking care of his responsibilities. This doesn't have to be confrontational and there could be explanations as to why he's behaving this way that don't implicate him of guilt, but I feel like it's a better idea to work out a plan together to address this issue. Praising him after he repeatedly ignores you is literally just positively reinforcing bad behavior. Also, I, I think telling wives that they should just be thankful that their husband is doing anything at all could be misconstrued as telling them that they should just be okay with inequality and sharing responsibility. In her book, Maribel states that a wife should do the following four things for her husband accept him, admire him, adapt to him, and appreciate him. Those things don't sound bad on the surface, but Maribel, being Maribel, of course, takes this to an extreme. She taught that wives should accept their husbands unconditionally because that's how Christ accepts us, that before a man can be expected to love his wife, she must first admire him, that a wife must fully adapt to the lifestyle and schedule of her husband, and that a wife should express gratitude to her husband so that hopefully he'll spoil her. In my opinion, what Maribel had to say about gratitude is very similar to what Milena said. Remember that the premise of Milena's video is how to get your husband drooling over you. An ungrateful wife is no joy to her husband, yet so many wives are guilty of gross ingratitude. They have forgotten the simple words thank you and all the actions and words those emotions connote. Thank your husband for all those little things in life and he'll begin to give you all those extras you've always wanted. Express to him how thankful you are or let him know that you're thankful for the little things that he did or just try to see the good. It's so easy for us to see the bad and always bring up the bad, but they're not, I guarantee you, they are not always doing the bad stuff. You're just choosing to only see the bad. So when they do something that you really appreciate and enjoy and like, let them know. Is that not the same for us? I feel like everything here can be applied to us. Like what, how much value or how much would you appreciate if your, your husband was constantly thanking you for every little thing that you were doing? Or how would you feel if your husband was always just speaking life over you? Or how would you feel if your husband was always being so sweet and tender to you? How would you feel, I was gonna say if he puts on lingerie for you, but I don't really apply. I mean, it might, like you don't know what couples might enjoy in the privacy of their bedroom. But like, take all of this and apply it the other way around. How great would you feel as a wife if it was being done to you? So do it to them first. It takes the first step of doing it. It takes you dying to your flesh to get there. So she's saying these tips can also be applied to husbands, but I'm not buying it. It's clear that this video is directed at wives. If she really meant that, then why didn't she just make a general advice video for both husbands and wives? Why is the language in this video so gendered? Why does she open up the video with verses that talk about wives submitting to their husbands? Why does she say multiple times throughout the video that a husband won't be won over by a single word? Why are so many of these tips predicated on the idea that men and women are inherently different? I am glad to see that she's saying that husbands should do these things too, but everything in her video thus far undermines this. Number six, do something you don't want to do that he's been asking you to do. Now, for some of us, we might be like, I have no idea what you're talking about. And for other ones, you're like, ugh. 
has your husband been asking you to watch a specific show or has he been asking you to go to a specific place with him or see a specific movie or do a specific activity has your husband been wanting to do something or is your husband have a specific hobby that you just can't stand and just want nothing to do with but to him it would really mean a lot if you did now's the week to do that sister do something that he enjoys that you've been putting off or haven't been wanting to participate in this might apply to you this might not but let this week be the week that you enjoy it. die to your flesh and enjoy that with him now little disclaimer if he's asking you to sin obviously you're not gonna do that but if he's not then you have the freedom to do that okay so i think this might be the first tip that i don't have any qualms with i think it is important to care about your partner's interests and take a part in that from time to time this is something that everyone in a relationship should be doing though not just wives and i think this can look different for different people it might work for some couples to be very hands-on with each other's interests while others might prefer something that's more like parallel play just as an example i'm a pretty big metal head and I really love going to metal shows, but Drew's not really a fan of loud environments. Recently, we both went to a death metal show here in Austin and we were able to find a spot on the balcony where I could see the stage really well and headbang and do my own thing. But um, there was also a couch on the balcony that was a little bit quieter where Drew could relax and feel more comfortable. Supporting your partner's interests doesn't mean that you have to be just as into it as they are. Just showing up can be more than enough. Number seven, allow him to be a person. Allow him to be his own person and his own thing. Allow him to go hang out with his guys and not complain to him about it when he comes home or allow him to go work out of the gym for longer than he would or allow him to do this or I want to use the word allow very loosely because you know, let him do these things without you getting annoyed, without you nagging him, without you withholding sex from him for doing it, without checking the time and seeing when he's coming back. Like give your husband freedom to be a person because he is a person. You know, it's wrong when we withhold stuff from our husbands because we want this or we want that or it's just selfish because we want them all to ourselves, sure, but it's healthy for a guy to go hang out with his guy friends. It's healthy for them to be able to go and do something without having this fear of coming back to an angry wife or without having this fear of being like, well, so-and-so is gonna be mad at me if I don't do this at this time. Like that is just not a fun feeling and so, Give him the ability to do that and let him enjoy it. Let him go and say, babe, come back whenever you're ready to come back. Now, obviously, again, like all of these, if he's going out to the strip clubs, that's not wise. Or if he's going out doing cocaine with the boys, that's not... That's not what I'm talking about here. So obviously use discernment with all of these. But if your husband just wants to go have a guy's night at Jimmy's house with Jimmy and Bob, let him go have a guy's night at Jimmy and Bob's house. I agree that it's not healthy to prevent your partner from having a life outside of the two of you. I'll, I'll agree to that. But I don't think the solution to this is to have the complete opposite reaction. It seems like what Milena is saying here is that if your husband wants to go out with friends that you as a wife should under no circumstances prevent him from going unless he's going to strip clubs and doing drugs, apparently. She frames things as very black and white, i.e. do this and don't do this. And she doesn't seem to be aware that an appropriate response is going to vary from situation to situation. There might be valid reasons that a wife prefers her husband to stay home instead of going out. Maybe she needs help with the kids. Maybe he already agreed to plans that she made. Or maybe she just feels like she has hasn't seen him much lately and just wants to spend time with him. Also, if a wife is supposed to allow her husband to do whatever he wants, as long as he's not doing lines off of a stripper, when does she, the wife, get to go out and do her own thing outside of the home? Will she ever get to have a girl's night if she's supposed to just and be okay with her husband going out whenever he feels like it? If women were to actually follow much of Milena's advice in this video, I think they'd end up very burnt out from taking on all the responsibility of the home and kids and marriage while their husband is spared the burden of any responsibility outside of his job. I swear this is the last time I'm going to bring up the total woman, but in her chapter on adapting to your husband's schedule and lifestyle, 
Maribel tells a story of a wife who was initially frustrated that her husband decided to go play card games with the boys instead of staying home and enjoying a romantic dinner that she had already prepared. But then, of course, because of Maribel's teachings, this wife realized that she was actually the one in the wrong. Later in class, Joan told us how frustrated she felt. I was livid, but I held my tongue. Silently, I cursed the total woman course, but as I walked him to the door, I vowed to give it one more try. I wanted to maintain a good attitude. So the story ends with her husband returning home early from hanging out with his friends, simply because she had a pleasant demeanor when he left. This book teaches that the only way a woman can convince her husband to treat her with love and respect is for her to show quiet reverence to him. Or, in other words, a husband won't be won over by a single word, but by the conduct of his wife. Whew, okay, I think I've been recording for three hours, <laughs> but we're finally at the end of this video. So what did you guys think? Are the regressive teachings of people like Maribel Morgan now being spread online through conservative Christian influencers? Let me know what you think down in the comments. Also, Milena and her husband have recently come out with a video titled How to Have Your Wife Drooling Over You. That's just as awful as this video. So for my next video, Drew and I are going to be sitting down and reacting to that one together. So stay tuned. Thank you so much for watching if you've made it this far. And a huge thank you to my patrons who help make these videos possible. If you like this video, please be sure to subscribe and ring the bell. If you'd like to follow me on social media, my Instagram is Taylor underscore the underscore antibot. And if you'd like to consider supporting this channel financially, a link to my Patreon will be down in the description. And I'll see you all in the next one. Say bye.